Hi, Yara. Thanks for doing this for us. Yeah, happy to be here. I'm in Boston for school, so senior year is starting. It's my, my annual East Coast move, but we haven't been here for a year and a half, so it's nice to be back. So what happens if, if for whatever reason, you know, the fourth wave kicks in full swing? Do you, do you guys, what happens in school? Don't That's a good manifest question. that. I really don't oh, know. No, it's I, already manifesting, but, <laughs> but I just want to know what you're going to do. I mean, we just go back to virtual. And so for me, I'm in my senior year. I'm writing my thesis and all of that. So that can happen from wherever in the world. Hopefully it happens on campus, but you just kind of go back to Zoom. You think these uh, schools with billion dollar endowments would have some really fancy way of going about it. But I think University of Phoenix was most prepared for this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. It's true, right? I and mean, what is it like? Can you see the other kids in the class uh, when you're doing it or you can only see the teacher? Oh, yeah, you can see everybody. I mean, every class is different. I took what when it first started, I was in old English, which was a crazy class. Um, and I was in <laughs> some other kind of uh, classes for black studies. And I mean, it's literally like any other conference Zoom for work or anything. You see everybody and it's quite mundane, but luckily, because I'm in the social sciences, nothing much changes since all we do is talk anyway. And wow. does the teacher call you, call on people in the class? Can people raise their hand? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, it's the same. People raise their hand. The silence is awkward. You're always talking over each other. Um, and the teacher can call you. They can, like, request to unmute you, too. <laughs> so... That becomes uh, that becomes a lot, especially oh. when you try and proceed with your day during class. Not the move, because they can yeah. unmute you and and turn on your camera. <laughs> oh, they can do it, or they you say request. Yeah, like, they can uh, do it on the. Yeah. They can they can request it, and then if you decline, then that's an issue. Oh man, that's <laughs> <laughs> that I wonder, crazy. Are there any creative class clowns like doing things that uh, bring attention to them? trying to think no i wish there were a lot of creative people on the call but i mean it's just so st straightforward and i think yeah. with the lingering presence of our gpa no one's willing to really mess around yeah ain't nobody playing it mm -hmm. that's what happens when you're at harvard i guess and it's a little yeah, different than harvard man, other schools so heavy. it is you know what but th then they just they just lost um dr cornell west mm -hmm. i heard this last semester, I was in a one-on-one -on -one class with him. Every year, I've been studying with him, um, and he's literally been one of my biggest mentors in these past some years. And I mean, just so sad. But honestly, I feel like that's, he's such a class act in transparency and in holding these these mm -hmm. systems accountable because it was such a political mm -hmm. move on Harvard's part in terms of their unwillingness to back the black radicalism that brings them so many dollars and, and pushes them forward as a progressive institution. I'm unfamiliar with what happened. Can you tell me exactly, can you guys explain it in like short form? Yeah, what basically. Happened? I don't know if you want, I would love for her to explain it, number one. <laughs> and number two, I don't even want to edit you to take it down to a short form yeah. since we, you have a, a yeah. real connection with him. Yeah, I mean, I haven't talked much about like why I chose Harvard, but Basically, my first touch point was knowing what black professors were there while I was going to be there. But I visited at like um, 13 because my cousin Nasir has a hip hop fellowship for grad students in uh, the Harvard's hip hop archive. And so my first like touch point with the school was all of these kids writing on the profound impact of hip hop in an academic setting. And from there, yeah. just being able to sit down with Dr. Gates, with with uh, Professor West, like has been incredible. But basically with Professor West, I mean, he um, was at Harvard, had left, I think, for similar reasons in that. Uh, the one thing he's unwilling to do is edit his political opinion, which I think is he has some one of the most empathetic views of politics and social issues that you would ever hear or understand. So the idea that Harvard as an institution wasn't willing to give him tenure, which is basically saying, you know, at any moment we're going to withdraw our support and you know tenure mm -hmm. is supposed to be there so that professors and all of these people that are supposed to be leaders in these fields have the safety and space to do their best work and know that these institutions are going to be there for them um and so they rejected his tenure this what a couple months ago which was just outrageous because 
I, he brings so many eyes and I think he makes Harvard like a valid place to study <laughs> because he brings the, the insights that this generation is looking for. Um, but yeah, I was just so grateful to spend this last semester. It was just him and I for two hours every other week talking about film and, and black media and impact. Um, it was so incredible. Wow. That's, a, gonna, that's an amazing, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an amazing, that's an amazing relationship, man. Mm -hmm. I wish, I wish I knew him. I don't. Yeah, he's incredible. <laughs> I mean, I've been in so many of his classes, and literally, it is just free flowing thought that is so. I don't know how he does it because I mean, he lectures on different things, and these could be two hour lectures. And I mean, sometimes it's just about music and its impact, and other times he's talking about like different forms of American thought and where they came from, and he has the craziest memory of anyone I have ever met. If he has met you before, he will recount something personal about your studies and your personal mission in life. Like it is, mm. it is the craziest thing. Wow. Mm. But yeah, I could go on and on forever about, about Professor West. I'm excited. He's going wow. to Union Seminary, which is one of the first places that hired him as an academic. And so it's a really full circle moment. Genius, man. He sounds like it. He is. Sounds You've seen like him before. No, I know who it is, but I'm oh. just saying, like, the way y'all... Uh, he can do a thousand bars. <laughs> <laughs> when I came to school, bars. you know, I didn't know. We had grown as shooting season two. I'd shot season one in my gap year. So we're going into, and I was shooting season two, and we had just gotten the memo that we were shooting in September. But I had moved to school already. We didn't know necessarily how we were going to make both work. And there was, a, for a moment, I was considering taking another year off. But it was literally sitting in his class. I walked out in tears. I was like, I've never been so moved and inspired. And that was when I knew I was like, oh, I have to be here now. Um, and mm. from <laughs> that point forward, I, I know Disney loved that call when I was like, so <laughs> I'm starting school, <laughs> yeah. but we made it work. <laughs> we made it work. Congrats. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I love everything that you are. Thank yes. you. Right. It starts with, you know, really smart. <laughs> then it goes into obviously beautiful i Thank mean it's you. forget about it um but then you know a lot of times we don't people don't really pay attention to a person's instincts and that's just as mm -hmm. much a part of your personality as you know your lexicon or your mm -hmm. like vernacular mm -hmm. you know like the words that you use you know your instincts tells you everything about you. Mm -hmm. They have informed almost every decision that you've made moving forward in this life. Mm -hmm. And it's like your instincts have just been amazing. I mean, to do those shows, so much. to go to school. I mean, I'm seeing what you're doing with Adidas. <laughs> you see, Thank you know you. what I mean? Thank like, I, I see you, like all of your instincts are just like uh, that's amazing. That's an honor. Thank you. I mean, I yeah. think we came into this industry knowing that Hollywood was fake. And from there came such an immense amount of freedom um, because it feels like you have to be impact and purpose driven. Otherwise, like for example, it feels like every red carpet is timed out with like a crisis in the world. And so nothing will make, push you into an existential crisis more than being in a pretty dress on a carpet while the world is in flames. <laughs> and after having too many of those experiences, it really pushes you every single time to be like, then why am I here and what am I doing here? We need more versions of you. We need that out there in the world. <laughs> we need, we just, be, just because you see it, man. Like sometimes you look around and you feel like, man, we're, man, we're like, you just listen to some shit. People say sometimes you're like, wow. You ever you ever did that? Like been in a of conversation course. with somebody and I'm like, wow, our number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, in the meantime though, bro. But just but like stupidity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's around it. Ignorance. Mm hmm Um he's there too. Um just um, that's everything, um hubris, mm -hmm. um lack of appreciation. Yes. You know. Inconsideration, inconsistency. Man, can't commit. No goddamn drive. <laughs> no ambition. You know, but you're listen, worried about a fucking car. What in car the meantime, are you gonna drive? You not driven yourself, like like that. <laughs> just, just, and I hear somebody say some stupid shit. And I just think to myself, Hold on, hold on. Damn, we outnumbered. What about your car? You drive when you ain't driven. That's no, bar. that's it. That's no, that's it, good. No, I get it. You feel me? That's like, it. You need to open a car dealership, and that should be like the pre, the, the pre, the what joint, you have to right? work out. Yeah. 
before you can get a loan on <laughs> yeah. a car. You gotta be driven before you get the car. <laughs> what's yes, your drive? Yeah, 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 what's your drive? Are you, are you, what's your drive? Are you driven? Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, that, that's dope. That should be, because that's mm-hmm. a problem, bro. That's just my issue. And I'm just saying, when I look at you, sis, I'm like, man, we need about 10 of them. <laughs> 10,000. <laughs> when you have... Um, all the support from people like the Obamas or Oprah or even having for, like someone like Pharrell say what he's saying to you now, do you find that there's extra pressure with everybody seeing through the potential they see in you? Like what, wh- what would happen if one morning you woke up and you were like, I don't want to do this anymore. Would you feel pressure from the outside? Like mm-hmm. how, how can I continue to do this? I mean, mm-hmm. we, we look at like Simone Biles right now and what mm-hmm. she's dealing with and it seems like while it looks like you can handle it, a lot of people are saying, hey, can you continue to do this and carry the throne for so many, especially young black girls that are mm-hmm. looking at you going, oh, if she can do it, so can I. Like, mm-hmm. what kind of pressure mm-hmm. does that bring? And who would be the first person you would tell if you didn't want to do it? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess I have to start by saying, like, it's not so much pressure because... I- the one thing I'm really grateful for out of the people that have supported me is they've given me permission to be myself. And oftentimes I feel as though the support, like from the folks that you've named, it hasn't been for the obvious reasons. It hasn't been like, oh, go keep acting. It's been because they've tapped into my natural passions. They've tapped into the fact that like I'm a total nerd and love that and will support me as I go into my nerd adventures. Um, But I mean, at the same time, I think one thing I've been working on, especially this year, has been boundaries in order to do my best work. And that came with calling so many of my mentors to try and figure that out because I very much fell into the space of feeling like I owed the world so much of myself. But the one thing that my mother has to continue to remind me is just the idea that I can't do my best work without caring for myself. And I I think I very much, even though this isn't what has been demonstrated to me, I very much come from a family that's work hard, play harder. But I used to think for so long that taking care of myself was inherently selfish. And like my biggest fear is living an inherently self-centric life. Um, And so this year has been I think the best shift in which any pressure that I had even previously felt has been alleviated because it is centered from what if I were to change the whole dynamic of how I treated this world and said I took care of myself first and from that trusted the products of this care would be the best products that could possibly be out there. So I'd have to say like if anything it's been (laughs) like less external and more so shifting what's been happening internally and how I've processed the world and what is expected of me. We need, we need 10 more. We need 10 more. See? <laughs> but, I told you. I mean, kids are not... My, my goal is to uh, help rewrite <laughs> public history education. So maybe that'll count? See? That'll count yeah, that'll for count. something? That'll count. That'll count. <laughs> look. Yeah. Look. That'll count. Mm-hmm. See? Told you. And the thing is, is that, you know, self-preservation is important because mm-hmm. if there's no you then you can't take care of somebody else. That's why mm-hmm. they tell you that on the airplane, like, you know, put right. your seatbelt on first. Right. Because if you're not alive to save nobody like, <laughs> yeah. you know, mm-hmm. maybe somebody else that fucking wore, it, wore their seatbelt can't would hopefully the, they'll be there for you. The mask. Mm-hmm. Um, but the. Um, yes, yeah, the mask. Right. Yeah, seatbelt. Yes, yeah, the mask. You're right. Um, but people get that twisted and it's like. There is a there. there sometimes there's a pre- when you're like a goat. Right. When mm-hmm. you're like really good at sh- People will say, well, you can't do that because you're letting down, you know, millions mm-hmm. of little girls, right? Like the Simone thing. But mm-hmm. she's actually not. And if she was ever going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to, like, I'm deciding to move ahead and do this, it needs to be because the universe has reminded you that you have an opportunity. Mm-hmm. And that in itself is so humbling. How could you not mm-hmm. take God up on his offer? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And in all those millions of girls, they become the the natural side effect of yeah, making that I mean, choice. Mm-hmm. Even thinking about mm-hmm. the everything that is happening in Simone Biles choosing to just prioritize her mental health has been such a shift. And even what we think of as necessary representation, you know, I think starting mm-hmm. Um, Blackish, that was kind of the return of just having a black family on broadcast television. Of course, we saw it before, and Mm -hmm. it's not like this was brand new, but 
we were still talking about representation as in the idea of needing quote unquote good representation. And that was even myopic because yeah. I, I think for so long, especially as black women, it's like you're the supervillain or the superhero. And Simone Biles mm -hmm. is reminding people and giving us space to just be human and allow us to, to go through all of the motions of being human versus feeling like we're invalid if we need to take time for ourselves and we're not pushing ourselves to the fullest extent. And I think it's helping us understand what a new version of representation is, where it isn't just like, oh, you have to be upstanding in this really narrow sense of the word at all times. But the idea that like you're giving people permission, it, it's the Marianne Williamson, who are you not to be? You're playing small mm -hmm. doesn't service the world. That's right. Mm -hmm. And for her, in my opinion, it's like, you know, as a spectator, somebody might be disappointed. They might be let down, but you're not disappointed by her mm -hmm. or let down by her. You're disappointed and let down that this is not the way it was written. Mm -hmm. She's the author of her history. She holds mm -hmm. her pen. And when she's decided she's going to sit down, she's going to sit. When she's decided she's going to stand up, she's going to stand. When she decided mm -hmm. she's going to go up in the air and do quintuple, quadruple, <laughs> double, triple, you know, uh, yeah. deca, <laughs> you know, whatever <laughs> it is, yeah. and decides to land it, she's the GOAT. She clearly knows how to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, that ain't... I listen, agree. She's, mm -hmm. she, when, when the spectator studies and becomes that good and goes to the Olympics and has achieved everything that she has, then, then they reserve the right to have an opinion. And at that point, if they want to keep going, they should keep going. Exactly. That's my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. Leave these, leave the GOATs alone, bro. Yeah. Like, just leave the goats alone. Everybody mm -hmm. got an opinion. Mm -hmm. I heard that. I heard that. I read that. Um, that that there was this one guy that was up that, that was on on a podcast, and he had like this opinion. And I just was like, man, you know what? I'm gonna let you have that because that's your right to have an opinion. But you do need. You do know that, that your opinion ain't. It ain't worth it. <laughs> like yeah. it don't have don't no merit. There's no currency connected mm -hmm. to it. It's nothing. I mean, it is a fart in the wind, my guy. You're lucky if someone heard it. <laughs> Not a fart. Yes, man. Like, it is a fart. Yo, what you just said is a fart in the wind. You're lucky if someone heard it. And the only benefit you got of when you is when you felt it, because none of us give a That's a benefit. <laughs> That's a beautiful you, metaphor. Fart in the wind? You no, feel me, though? No, That's all no, it is. Yeah. Just a fart in the wind, bro. And they have that one at Harvard? First. A lot of kids saying that one at Harvard? <laughs> I mean, they're yeah. about to if I have anything to do with it. Oh, man. man, that's a fart in the wind. We don't give a sh. When you don't deserve, man, you lucky if somebody universe. heard it. A fart, that's man. Good word, period. Fart. Just... You can and you can always tell when somebody can lonely. He's... Yeah, they, they, I hate when they have such strong opinions. He probably can't even do a front row. Whoever you talking about, and he telling her that she need to get out there. Like, just cut it out, man. You can't do a front row. You can't even do a front row. <laughs> what was it like growing up in your house? Like, I, what we need to be studying and distributing is your parents' curriculum for you. Yes. Right. First of all, before she answers one question, have you seen her mom? She looks five minutes Beautiful. older than her. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, when they, she does. It's true. It's she, true. When they sit side by side, I swear I to might, you, well, they don't, she don't look like an older sister. I they look it was like her sister. Oh. the mom looks like she's five minutes older than her. No Hi, bullshit. mom. And super nice, <laughs> mm -hmm. super cool, and super witted. She ain't taking no, but she's so <laughs> nice. And you see clearly between her and your father, you can tell, like what mm -hmm. what cloth you were cut from. The mom mm -hmm. is the same way. That's amazing. Super focused. So go ahead and answer, yeah. Scott. I just need to just <laughs> yeah. give your mother. No, I appreciate that. You know, I love her bouquet. I love chocolate mommy love. Uh, but <laughs> I'd have to say, like, my parents were so intentional. Um, you say curriculum, and I quite literally had one. Like, they had an mm. alternate curricula for everything that wasn't being taught in school. I was very much an educational guinea pig. I've been to, like, 12 different school programs. I've done Montessori, all-girls Catholic school, distance learning, the whole shebang. Okay. Um, okay. But that came from, like, them wanting me to have agency in what I did. Like, I, I never actually really shifted my school plans for work. Um, school always came first in these places. But I think, if anything, I've been so grateful just because there's... 
like the, this priority on just intergenerational exchange in my family. So my mother is just like her father, my papa, and the three of us are triplets <laughs> um, in terms of how we mm. operate in the world. And in so many ways, you know, he was extremely active in the civil rights movement, uh, was the reason black students had so many resources in Madison, Wisconsin. Like when I got to meet Dr. Angela Davis, the first thing I had and first reference point I had was this picture of her and my papa from when he brought her to speak at school. And so coming from that space in which the one thing my parents did was always make me feel like what I said mattered. And so home was like a training ground for developing an opinion. And I, I don't know how many kids are given that space um, because mm -hmm. it's arbitrary. The idea that you're supposed to be 18 or a young adult and suddenly have this well-developed opinion of the world when you've been given no practice to, to just mm. start to figure out what matters to you and why, why is that opinion of yours going to change, even though you held it so strongly five seconds ago. And so that is really what my home's given me. And, and you said growing up in my home in the past tense, but I'm very much still growing up in my home. I had no urgency to leave the house, um, which became <laughs> quite a problem in college. There came a point where I think <laughs> my, my father hopped on a plane at like 5 a.m. because I lost the freshman 15 food here was mediocre. That's a total side note, but <laughs> he, he came all the way over just to make me my favorite soup and my favorite Persian food. Um, but yeah, and being uh. bicultural too, I think there's this priority on being a global citizen and you know, like we didn't watch much TV and stuff growing up, but thinking about the representation I had in my family, uh, I mean, it's just a gift. Like my, my, my cousin, my Khale, um, is, one of the first is the first Iranian female space tourist and she went to the space station and then, you know, mm. to have Nasir as my cousin and, and being so open and being that entry point for me getting like having these experiences in these academic spaces. Um, and then have, coming from a family of educators coming from family that just prioritize creativity. Um, you know, I, I think it was the idea of even my father started his, career working with Prince as his photographer. And there's something about the experiences they curated for me and that everything was a family affair. So there are pictures of me and my brothers in the tour books, because if, if they were going to London, we were going to London um, or Hawaii or wherever. And I think mm -hmm. there's something about at that young age, feeling like literally everything was possible that has really shifted so much of what I, I felt like I could do growing up. And if anything, I think going out into the world, it was the most jarring thing was the idea that other people didn't realize everything was possible and didn't think that everything that I thought was possible was something that I could achieve. And so that was a bit, a bit of a reset yeah. Um, yeah. To, to getting because on the right true. path. But yeah, I, I feel like I owe so, you, so much to my family. So you, you, you did uh, look around when you were young going, damn, mm -hmm. we're outnumbered. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, <laughs> yeah. to go from this experience in which, like, my world was diverse and the idea of, like, my parents had us learning about cultures, our own cultures, of course, but every other culture. And every time I asked for a different religious book, they gave it to me and were the first to help me explore whatever I wanted to. And so to go into a world in which it was like, wait, this isn't the opportunity everyone is given. Um, and, and to, one, either realize the privilege in what I had been given, but two, like you're saying, realize just how different the perspective is. Um, but it goes to like how we teach people to relate to each other and like why I'm so focused on history in particular is that when you look at textbooks, like you have been taught that other people's stories are not contingent on your own and like had nothing to do with your own. And so why are you supposed to suddenly care about this community or this minority group if it felt like you got here by yourself? And I think the idea that like they fundamentally changed how I learned history had everything to do with just why you have to care about people after that when you realize how many people gave up their lives for people that they didn't know <laughs> like just because they were working towards a future they they weren't guaranteed but knew was essential like you have to care i feel like we're getting our one-on-one -on -one it's a good thing yeah it's a good thing <laughs> we are you're educating yeah. us yeah you're definitely educating us it seems like there's so much growth like inside of you, uh, co comparatively speaking to the people mm -hmm. um, that were your age growing up. Like, was it hard for you to relate to kids your own age when you were younger? I've always been an old person. Like, this is an ongoing, I don't know, theme in my life of uh, 
Yeah. It, it took also, a second. I feel like I've found, I've definitely found so many like incredible young people. And I, I feel like if anything, like there's a misnomer that there are not many young people like me and to a certain extent, sure. But I feel like a lot of it is just resources. And I, I think I found so many of my peers to be, even though we're not the same, to be in similar spaces, uh, light years ahead of what has been presented to them. And so I feel like I, I have been able to find every step of my life, those folks in my age group that inspire me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm a homebody anyway, so that's a lethal combination of being a homebody that's old. Like, it, it just <laughs> meant that finding friend groups um, was something, I don't know, it was difficult. And I feel like really now in my early 20s, I'm just now starting to find groups that I really belong in. And it comes from, I mean having other folks like they don't have to care about the same things that you do but it's exactly what you've been saying before they know what drives them and that's inspiring no matter how tethered you are to what drives them <laughs> just seeing other people mm -hmm. on a mission um yeah you got any cancers around you <laughs> I, think, I don't know i have a lot of leos in my life mm. i have a lot of leos what in my you? life i'm an aquarius um mm. I'm an Aquarius. My brother's an Aquarius. Grandfather's an Aquarius. Um, mm. Do you know what your rising is? It's debated. I'm either a Scorpio or a Leo rising. Mm. Break it down, <laughs> I've gotten, I've, I've heard both. But what does that mean for me? Oh, I mean, no, no, no. I'm. It wasn't. I was. Well, you kept saying homebody, and I was <laughs> like, I wonder who in her life is like like that, or mm -hmm. if you have any cancer in your sign anywhere. Yeah. No, I mean, I feel like homes. Moon? Aries. Wow. Mm -hmm. Break but, it down, bro. Well, no, no, no. No, <laughs> I want to hear like, no, 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 no. It's cool, but that's interesting. Because mm -hmm. she, she's a, she's a, she's a Aquarius, and her moon is uh, Aries, which is fire. So she's air sign with fire, and then her rising, you said, is either Scorpio or Leo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if it's if it's Leo, you'd be like a, it'd be fire. Mm -hmm. So two fire and one air. And if it's Scorpio, it'd be water, air, and then fire. That's what I am: water, air, and fire. Oh wow! Oh, you're on the cusp. Are uh, you on the cusp? I think it's about. I'm not on the cusp. I've just heard because I've gone to different people, and even though I have the same birth time, I know my birth time, my birth location. I don't know why this has always mm -hmm. been up in the air. Like okay. <laughs> people have just written down both well i know we have to wrap it up soon with you but i wanted to ask you some uh a, a couple of questions of what kind of music you're listening to now yeah. yeah oh my goodness i feel like i wouldn't exist if not for music um i am listening to a lot of teo he just dropped his new album uh and i'm listening to we're a big Bob Marley household, and so Misty Morning mm. has been the song that I've currently been replaying a lot. Uh, the line, I want you to straighten out my tomorrow, I, I'm, I haven't fully understood what it meant, but I feel it every time he says it. <laughs> um, and then I'm trying to think. I've been listening to Weston Estate, lots of James Blake. I'm a little all over the place because Fiddler on the Roof is thrown somewhere in there. And then, <laughs> uh, and then I'm trying to think. The other one, the other thing that I've been playing is one of one of your song, Popular Thug, has been one in which Whoa. <laughs> I just Whoa. <laughs> like Wow. <laughs> it makes that it to like every twenty playlist. years ago. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. I told the universe at some point that I wanted to be friends with musicians because it may sound so reductive, but I was like, before the musician, there was silence. And the idea of living in silence sounds so daunting. And somebody that can create sound and orchestrate it in a way that's cohesive, like, mm. I find whatever I do to be much less impressive. <laughs> but the universe listened, and I think surrounded me with so many really cool folks that, that keep me inspired. And concerts are the only reason I will stay at past my self-prescribed bedtime. Wow. <laughs> Will you do it again? Self-prescribed bedtime. <laughs> You're amazing. I am music 
obsessed and I think in many ways it's it's why I function and how I function I'm always listening to something but it's because I, I think growing up in our household we listen to audiobooks and all that so it was always very auditory house uh, or just inclined that way I think I listened to 130,000 minutes of NPR last year when wow. they give you the, <laughs> the recount. But it means like people always hear a little voice whispering in my back pocket because I'm always playing something. So what do you prefer? Do you prefer reading graphically or do you prefer audiobooks? I prefer, it depends on what I'm trying to get from it. I, I think I'm a big annotator. I'm a super note taker. So if I'm okay. reading, par- it sometimes not enjoyable because I have like three highlighters, too many things that I want to note. <laughs> and then when I'm listening, I can just sit back and enjoy. And I think it's just such a, it's mm. such a compelling way to storytell because it leaves so much more up to the imagination um, yeah. than, than when you're handed the visuals. Yeah, it's true. I like audio books. <laughs> Listen, you're a, a delight. You need Thank to know you. that, sis. Like it is, Listen, little sister, you're special. Thank you. And every every facet. I agree. I, and, it's an honor. You know, again, I say this respectfully. At some point, <laughs> we need ten more of you. <laughs> well, they just cloned a, a sheep, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Oh, in certain it's parts possible. of the world, they've been they, they've been cloning people for a minute. Yeah. In, in <laughs> certain parts of the world, yeah. There's so it'll be my, possible. Crazy yeah, my friend, he, he really, my he friend really, cloned really? his two Rottweilers. What? So now he has two baby Rottweilers. Yeah. He cloned them? From oh the ones God. that were about to die. I'm not with the cloning, B. That's crazy. I watched too many movies. By the way, the soul ain't going to be the same. Yeah, you, mm-hmm. I, I'm not with the cloning. Have you, you just seen? Getting the, it's, the physical's going to be the same, but not I the, took not the such interesting classes on like morality and such, but I forget. I think his name is Ray Kurzweil. I think yeah. that's yeah. him. Ray but Kurzweil, yeah. 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 I think his yeah. theories, the, he's and then awesome. there's... He's an author. And singularity. then there's another one. Yeah, the singularity, and then talking about... I don't know if this was also one of his theories, but talking about the idea of time and space travel, but it's all to get you to think about how important the soul is. Like, if you mm-hmm. knew that transport teleportation was possible, but it was the destruction of your atoms and recombination of your atoms in other space, is that still you? And some people are inclined to say yes mm. right away, but then they were saying like, well, what happens if the destruction and the recreation doesn't happen at the same time? So two of, you's exi- two of you exist, um, at mm-hmm. least for a moment. Is that still you? Um, and it's just so interesting going down that kind of rabbit hole <laughs> of what, what book you is think that? makes yourself. Yeah, that I know. I want to read that too. Which I'll book find is that? it. I'll find it. It's not. I don't know if it's a book as much as it's just like a theory or a paper that he wrote about, but I'll I'll find it. I've never listened to an (laughs) audio book and I keep saying I'm trying to tell them the audio books is the way, right? Or just podcasts. There's so many like that have taken on, have just been at the forefront of figuring out new ways to format storytelling. I'm trying to think of like, there's so many good ones and they're, they're the gateway to, um, audio books. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Let me know because that one, that that one right there, you just that pitch, you just sold me. I'm like, oh, I'm listening to that. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, you got me. Yeah, I'm an audio evangelist. What's one hope you have for the future? That's a hard one um, because I feel like we're at such a time in which you want so much to change, but. I think one thing we were talking about, I was talking about with a group of my classmates was kind of this idea of like when you're in the work of being socially engaged, the goal is to create the foundation so that people can dream past where you are. Like, Mm -hmm. I think for a second, I wanted the world to look exactly as my vision of of what I think equity is and what I think uh, freedom is. But I feel like I'm now at a point in which it's like, how can I how can I help set the foundation such that gen alpha and whoever's coming after can have the resources to push past what even my understandings of equity and freedom are but i think on a smaller scale you know we're at a time in which we've been talking about reformation for so long like the idea of just changing little parts of a system and hopefully getting it to work um and one thing that i think it was 
Frederick Douglass in one of his essays was talking about the issue with reform is that it inherently validates the system that you're seeking to change because it's saying it's okay as long as you adjust this one thing. And I feel like mm. my biggest hope is this idea of just reinserting imagination, like a deep founded imagination. And you think about just the atrocities that so many people go through, especially as folks of color, and how much we've been able to imagine under those pressures is astounding. But I'm yeah. just hoping for the conditions in which like every time we get to move forward, there's just more space to imagine because there's less time thinking about how to preserve our lives because that's a guarantee. Wow. I saw that you posted about James Baldwin and being one yes. of your heroes, and I would love to give you like a, an opportunity to say why. Oh, I'm a Baldwin stan. Uh, it's yeah, an issue. Yeah, he's a G. <laughs> He's a G. <laughs> and it was an issue. Yeah, literally my when I graduated from high school, my gift was hearing the filmmaker Raul Peck speak about his doc, I'm not your Negro. It was such a gift. It was at the Schomburg Center. Whoa. It was yeah, it was at the Schomburg before. Center in Harlem. It was incredible. But like even my I only have a couple tattoos, but even my little one, 63, is for the year he released The Fire Next Time. But I feel like I, I think what it is is like James Baldwin, like so many of my favorite folks, just straddled so many spaces. Like he has a deep appreciation for the role of art, a deep appreciation for the role of love. Um, but like, I, I feel like he gives words and voice to so many of the complicated issues of growing up and trying to make the world a better place. And I feel like his ability to do that, whether it be in his essays or even in his fiction, it was so transformative to me because it just helped name and push forward these these kind of pieces of ideas that were ruminating and I never fully understood them. I think the first piece I read of his was um, a short story called Sonny's Blues, which I absolutely love. But it's basically about an older brother that's coming in to take care of his younger brother who's been getting into some trouble. And in this like 12 page story, he goes through so much. He goes through, there's this kind of one quote talking about how just as young black kids, there was the darkness of our lives and the darkness of the movies that kept pushing forward images that didn't exist and felt unattainable. And I think even in his um, lecture, one of his most popular lectures was uh in Cambridge, and he talks about the idea that, um, you know, by the age of five or six or seven, what is it? This is going to be a loose paraphrase, <laughs> but everything you've seen is white, so you assume you're white too, and it comes as a great shock when you realize the flag that you pledged allegiance to along with everybody else did not pledge allegiance to you. And I think, like, in that statement, he so succinctly states the issue, as well as so succinctly states the solution and what we're striving for, which is this idea of a society that is as deeply invested in our well-being as we are in the well-being of the country. And so, yeah, I, I feel like I could go on forever about Baldwin, but, I mean, even the first time uh, I met Frank Ocean, I was talking to his lovely mama, and I was like, you know, what I love was the fact that Lens, his song that uses the Carrie James Marshall artwork, reminds me of Giovanni's <laughs> Room in the third act. So this song is a James Baldwin book. Um, I've written papers on this, but, but I just, I love the fact that you can connect so much of his work to art. And he he's like, he knows everybody. So I feel like James Baldwin is a great entry point to get to know other prolific people that have gone so under-recognized. He's, first of all, I love everything that you said, and I agree. James mm -hmm. Baldwin is, mm -hmm. his bars, mm -hmm. he would say things in the middle of the 60s and the whole room would not know what to do or say back to mm -hmm. him because not only did he shock them in his being right, but they were not equipped because mm -hmm. they'd never even considered <laughs> anything like that. And mm -hmm. this guy was literally like, he's in a room full of checker players <laughs> and he himself was already like seven steps ahead in chess. Right. Like that's perfectly that guy, put. Forget it. Mm -hmm. just, he's just, he, everything he said was a bar. That's mm -hmm. I bet when he ordered his food, you could learn something. <laughs> Absolutely. <from him. laughs> Oh, man, I be feeling so dumb when I be talking to people that got all this together at 18 and 21. Like, you've done so much, man. It's amazing. I commend you. Thank I you. I don't have it all together. You talk. No, little sis, you actually do. You do have it all together. You have it all together. In fact, it's not even two pieces, uh, <laughs> you know, buttoned up to be together. It's just one piece. Uh, there's no seam. There's no zipper. <laughs> 
Those I, this. I mean, that's how together you have it. It's just literally you just one piece, piece of cloth. The one that I told you you were cut from, your mom and dad. Mm -hmm. If you saw my stitches of how I'm holding it together, you will understand that you have it together. Thank you. Right. Thank you for no, your time, thank sis. You and your so space. Much. Thank you. Pleasure. No, Pleasure I so appreciate you. it. I've loved listening since the launch. That was my NPR One podcast suggested it. I've been listening religiously. So grateful oh, wow. to be on.